An Ivy League university president resigns over her handling of anti-Semitism on her campus. Israel-Hamas ceasefires talks continue today in Qatar with Hamas not wanting to participate fully. And is the U.S. presidential campaign being hacked? Well, joining me from Los Angeles is Lisa Daftari. She's our foreign affairs expert and editor-in-chief of the Foreign Desk. Thanks for joining me again, Lisa. Great to have you on. Thank you. Great to be back with you, Jeanette. Okay, so Lisa, ceasefire talks, they were set to resume Thursday in Doha, Qatar, with international mediators meeting with an Israeli delegation to try to end the Israel-Hamas war. Now, uh, Hamas did not participate directly in the talks and accused Israel of adding new demands to a previous proposal. So, Lisa, does this mean these so-called peace talks are going to break down if one of the parties doesn't want to take part? What, what can you tell us about this situation? Yeah, I mean, break down, they would have had to been something significant to begin with. <laughs> uh, all along, we've been dragging, right? If, if they had been um, somewhat productive, we would have seen the hostages back in Israel, and, and we don't. Um, and to that end, we don't even know if the hostages are alive, how many are alive. Um, you know, every so often we hear about, you know, a couple of them that have been killed or the, their remains found by the uh, Israeli military. Um, this is an interesting situation because, you know, many people don't realize how many opportunities there have been for a ceasefire where, uh, where Hamas has rejected the offers to show up. Um, and then meanwhile, you know, a lot of people on the pro-Palestinian side is like, ceasefire, ceasefire, yes, but you have to call upon the leader of the uh, uh, of Gaza, of the Palestinian people, Hamas. Um, it's an interesting situation because it's a, it's 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 an internationally labeled terrorist organization, but they're also the, the government of of the Palestinian people. So um, they are treated and they are, there's normalized relations with them in certain ways, but then they're also obviously a brutal, brutal um, terrorist organization that carried out the October seventh attack. So you know what will be. This is a very interesting time while the world and Israel awaits a retaliation from the Islamic Republic. What will that look like? There's a lot of psychological warfare going on here because they're just waiting and waiting and waiting. Um, and, you know, every couple of days they say it's imminent, it's imminent. Um, you know, my sources said the other day it's going to be on, on Tuesday or Tuesday night and, and, and it didn't happen. So um, in the meantime, there is talks of... Um, of a preemptive strike by Israel. We know that the United States has come out and said, we're trying to stop that. Um, so a lot of pressure on Israel not to go forward with that. So we wait. Yeah, exactly. So breaking this all down, uh, like what does Israel want? They want the hostages free, right? What does Hamas want? They, they just right. want, like they want to be free, so to speak, right? And is well, that what's kind so of causing this Right, this clash that's been going on for years. Um, yeah. So Hamas is, again, the elected government of the Palestinian people. Again, they are also a terror organization. That's how they function. This is just their DNA. Um, Israel has two... Uh, priorities in this particular war, and that is uh, to get the hostages back and to decimate Hamas. In general, what is Israel's approach? It wants to survive in a neighborhood where many enemies surround it. We have this ring of fire, so to speak, that was created by the Islamic Republic, the regime that has occupied Iran for the last 45 years. And within that ring of fire, you have Hamas, you have Hezbollah in Lebanon, you have insurgencies in Iraq and Syria, you have the Houthis in Yemen, uh, you have Palestinian Islamic Jihad, um, the PA has not been so great to Israel. So, you know, it's, it's been ongoing for, for decades um, where, you know, you see these intifadas, where is this attack on Israel because they just don't want Israel to exist. Um, and to that point, it's not just a political war or war over land. You see attacks on Jews all over the world. Um, so it's, it's really a war of um, anti-Semitism. It's a war of, um, you know, really getting rid of Israel. And for that reason, it is an existential threat for Israel. My goodness. And then meanwhile, Lisa, the Islamic Republic is ex expediting its nuclear weapons efforts and will resume tests of nuclear bomb detonators for what they're calling a peaceful atomic program. So Lisa, is this something that uh, should be alarming to all of us? And, and it has to have it had to have been alarming for a very long time, but it has been ignored uh, by uh, you know the United States for a while. So th we've heard for a long time now that the Islamic Republic is just around the corner from having nuclear weapons. We know that their centrifuges are spinning. We know that they are working on a delivery system. We know that um, they have 
the intention. And that is really all, all we need to know. Um, the fact that, you know, and, and then we get down to the nitty gritty. Is it, are they a week away? Are they a month away? Are they a year away? Well, all those time frames have passed now. So they either have a nuclear bomb or they're very close to having one. Now, how do we deal with a regime that is a rogue and has either nuclear ambition or has a nuclear weapon or is very close to having one? Um, well, we don't make nice with them. We don't appease them. We don't allow them to, uh, you know, rake in billions of dollars then that which it then puts into its terror proxies to wreak havoc not only on our ally Israel but throughout the world uh, in 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 through its its terror proxies. Um, that is when you know in terms of policy when we look at the at Europe at the United States they have um, many many times over the last forty five years that the regime has been in power have appeased them have ushered in this political Islam has allowed this normalization to occur and the removal of those sanctions is what has allowed Iran to sell oil, sell weapons to Russia, um, and rake in billions of dollars, which was used on October 7th as well. Wow. And this week, uh, the Taliban uh, celebrated three years back in power in Afghanistan and hosted a demonstration at a former U.S. air base featuring an extensive display of American military equipment. Now, Lisa, we might need to be reminded that in 2021, the mm -hmm. Taliban uh, seized control of Afghanistan almost immediately after the Biden administration withdrew U.S. forces from the region. And it was, of course, criticized as a chaotic and hasty operation that left right. 13 troops dead, not to mention how many millions of dollars of uh, military equipment was left there for them. Right. And put a terror organization at the helm of yeah. Afghanistan, where we spent 20 years of, of blood, treasure. You know, it, it's a horrific situation. And it really set the pace for this abysmal, um, you know, foreign policy that has been entirely anti-American and pro-jihadi. Um, it, it's 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 difficult to really uh, quantify um, how vulnerable this made the region in terms of having, again, another um, jihadi group uh, be normalized as an actual government. So, you know, political Islam on the march. Um, we're seeing this with Hamas in Gaza, with the Islamic Republic in Iran, and of course, the Taliban in Afghanistan. Um, the way that in which the Biden administration withdrew, it showed U.S. vulnerability. Again, it left um, military equipment, which is now in the hands of the Taliban. And they're doing, Jeanette, everything they said they wouldn't do. We were promised uh, by the Biden administration that this is not the Taliban of the 90s. This is a new and improved Taliban. Well, They've proved to be worse than the Taliban of the 90s. They have, you know, women don't have rights. They don't go to school, many of them. They can't have normal jobs. They can't even, you know, go out to a doctor's appointment without a male chaperone in many cases. So um, it's been a very difficult time for Afghanistan to, to really withstand 20 years of, of war and turmoil, um, you know, with, with uh, Western assets being there and now, you know, having this at the end of all of that. Um, so it's 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 extremely important to mark that it has been three years, but uh, the consequences carry on. Wow. And of course, it is an election year in the U.S. And now we're hearing that Google is warning that Iranian efforts to hack U.S. presidential campaigns are still ongoing. So, Lisa, how alarmed are people about this considering it is an election year? You know, it should really wake people up to the fact that Microsoft had another report earlier this week that we had on the foreign desk, and now we're seeing it by Google that the Iran regime is interfering. Why are they interfering? Because they actually have a preference. Our friends and enemies should not have any preference as to who is the president of the United States, because our foreign policy should be that consistent administration to administration. Foreign policy, counterterrorism, national security, these are nonpartisan issues. They are bipartisan issues. We should be on the same page as to how we handle Afghanistan, how we handle Russia and Ukraine, how we handle uh, what's going on between Israel and, and these terrorist entities. And yet we are not. There's almost a 180 in many cases with where we are uh, in terms of, 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 of these different issues and how different administrations will handle them. So, of course, the Islamic Republic doesn't want to be punished under a Trump administration. They don't want to be sanctioned. They don't want to be curbed. What do they want? They want to be appeased. They want to have great relations. They want the sanctions removed, which is why it's not surprising that they would want uh, the Kamala Waltz ticket and that they are interfering in order to uh, influence it as much as they can. Okay. Also on U.S. soil, uh, the president of Columbia University resigned from her position on Wednesday after just one year on the job. And of course, this comes months after anti-Israel protests shut down the campus. And Lisa, uh, she'd been facing calls to resign for months over her handling of those protests. 
Yeah, it was horrific the way she handled those protests. The fact that uh, such um, not just, you know, anti-Jewish students, student, Jewish students didn't feel comfortable going to school in a major Ivy League university in New York City in the year 2024. I mean, let that really sink in. And the fact that she at the helm took such a long time to take any sort of action. And when she did, it was lukewarm at best. Well, heads have to roll. And these are the consequences. So yes, she is resigning. And there has been a lot of pressure for her to resign. I'm frankly um, surprised it took this long. Uh, but here we are. I mean, campuses are, are starting back up again for fall semester that everyone's moving in. I think classes start soon. Um, we we want to see some consequences so we don't see this happen again. It's not just anti-Jewish students, by the way. These are pro-jihadi movements. And we have seen that, A, many of these individuals that are um, much older than 22 years old, they're on campus, they're helping to organize these, um, th these protests. So they're coming in as third party. They're coming in to, you know, ignite and to really make sure that these um, protests carry on, that, that the encampments carry on. Uh, and that we also found out over, over the last few months that the Iran regime has its hand in, in funding and organizing these protests. The irony, Jeanette, of the, of the Islamic Republic cracking down on its own college students inside Iran, killing them, hanging them, you know, putting them in prison, maiming them, taking their eyes out for speaking out against the government. And here they are recruiting American college students as their useful idiots to do their dirty work and to promote them and to um, you know, organize and fund and pay for uh, their demonstrations. It's, it's, it's mind boggling, really mind boggling. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Lisa, turning our attention now to Asia. So North Korea finally announces that its borders will be opening to receive international tourists in December. So we all know that North Korea is an isolated country with very tightly controlled borders, but why weren't they allowing tourists and why are they now all of a right. sudden? Yeah, I don't know, Jeanette, are you racking up those frequent flyer miles to get yourself <laughs> to, get to, to North, North Korea. Korea for Christmas? Um, yeah, I don't think this is going to become, you know, anyone's really going to bite here. Um, you know, it, it's an interesting statement to make. Perhaps, um, you know, we knew that Donald Trump, for example, had warmer relations with North Korea. It didn't lead to much, but the fact that a U.S. president stepped foot in, you know, North Korea, the fact that they were able to write letters back and forth and have a conversation, um, it, it, it was, you know, we were kind of flirting with the idea of, uh, of, of opening up to North Korea. They have shown very different behavior in the last four years, but perhaps that's what they're going for, to say, well, this, this, this is what could potentially be who wants to have a conversation. By the same token, they are still firing missiles. They're still testing their military equipment. Um, we know they're, they're, they're you know, chest thumping, um, you know, the same way that they have been for years. So can't really take anything the North Koreans do seriously, but we should keep an eye on it. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also in Asia, uh, we're looking to China now. So uh, we have a 25-year-old Sergeant Corbin Schultz, who is a U.S. Army intelligence analyst. Now he's pleaded guilty to charges of selling military secrets to China. So this young man had top secret clearance. Not something I would have thought of doing when I was 25, but uh, what, what can you tell us about this? You know, it's interesting. This is one case that we covered at the Foreign Desk. There have been many cases like this uh, in the past, and it, it's always having to do with Russia, China, and Iran's regime. Why? Because they are using influence campaigns right now, taking advantage of a very vulnerable environment within the United States, where they're able to infiltrate public and private sectors to get secrets and send them out to their, their home countries, or in this case, a, you know, was recruited by, um, you know, one of these uh, uh, countries. You know, we have seen in the past, whether they're interns to Washington, D.C., whether they're working in our labs, whether they're working at our universities, um, working in the Pentagon, in the case of one woman uh, who, is, who has, you know, connections to Iran's regime, she's still working there. She has top security clearance, and she's, you know, exchanging emails with Iran's foreign minister. Um, Look, even if this administration doesn't come back, or I should say the Kamala Harris uh, ticket doesn't win in, in November, and it, it happens to be Donald Trump, it will take many, many months to rid and to detect how far this influence campaign from, again, these multiple rogue elements have penetrated 
especially inside Washington, D.C., in our military, in our uh, Department of Defense, Department of Justice, State Department, Pentagon, and the list goes on. Um, so, you know, it, it, it really speaks to this culture that we have almost boasted about here in the United States. I know Canada feels the same way, where we're very inclusive, right? So if somebody is from a different country or they have lived in a different country, we very much want to welcome them and say, wow, you know, we have an intern from China. We have an intern from Iran. We have an intern from um, Russia. It, you know, it, 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 it's, it's what we like to do here. We are a melting pot. We like to be diverse. Um, we also have to be careful. We have to be careful that everybody who is here, whether they're American or not, uh, has, you know, has their allegiance to the United States. And that's a very difficult thing to test when you meet someone, when you interview someone. Uh, and I think, you know, things like this should be a wake up call to the United States as to how far we, you know, how compromised we are, or how far these influence campaigns have reached. Well, uh, we're out of time here, but uh, she's our foreign affairs expert and editor in chief of the Foreign Desk. Lisa Deftari, thanks so much for joining us again today. Thank you for having me, Jeanette.